Okay, let me begin the introduction. So, Mina doesn't need uh, an introduction. She was a student here. Now she's a professor at the Rimeter Institute. She holds the Aristarchos Chair for Theoretical Physics. She pioneered the idea of using uh, rotating black holes to look for new physics, to look for new particles like the axioms as a postdoc. And, and she also pioneered many ideas for doing small-scale experiments to look for new physics uh, beyond the standard model. For her work, she won the award uh, 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 shared with her intellectual siblings, Peter and, and Surjit. Uh, Mina is both loved and feared in the community. <laughs> she, <laughs> she loved uh, of her great personality. She's also feared because she's an extremely strong critic of incomplete work. And uh, she's a very high standard, which she holds for herself. Uh, for example, her average citation of her paper is over 200. So, uh, today, uh, she will talk about uh, work that she started about uh, two years ago. Uh, two years ago, she decided that she wanted to start working on something that is actually known to exist. And uh, for that, she chose an extremely challenging problem the problem of trying to detect the cosmic neutrino background radiation. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Savas, for the great introduction. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a true pleasure to give this talk to you guys. I think you've heard some of it from Savas. Uh, and in many ways, it feels like giving the talk to friends. So feel free to interrupt me during the talk with questions. It makes for a more uh, a lively discussion, it's always better that way. So the title of the talk summarizes what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the cosmic neutrino background distribution on the surface of the Earth. And, um, and for that, I need to put things in a bit of a context before I tell you about that. And uh, a, the cosmic neutrino background is a relic of the Big Bang, so I have to give you a little background both about the Big Bang and about neutrinos as well. Uh, because these neutrinos are not of the usual sort that people detect in laboratories. So, um, so this picture here summarizes our standard view of how our universe came to be. A uh, long, long time ago, we don't know exactly when, there was a huge type of explosion, which we call the Big Bang, um, that started it all. Then there was a period of exponential growth that made the universe isotropic. Point. Yeah, well, I don't need a point. <laughs> I don't need a point. <laughs> Uh, there was an exponential growth that made the universe very uniform and isotropic. And after that a period ended, the universe was what we call reheated uh, when inflation ended, it became very hot. And since then it's just cooling and expanding. Okay? And as it cools and expands, it, it goes through different phases. So in, the, in early days, in very early times, um, the universe was much so hot that you didn't even have protons and neutrons. You only had free quarks. As the universe cooled, you created nuclei, but you still didn't have atoms because nuclei are crea have binding energies much larger than that of atoms. Um, Later, atoms formed when it became, uh, when the universe uh, cooled enough and became energetically favorable to have atoms. Um, eventually, um, the, the atoms that formed slowed down enough due to the expansion, cooled down enough, so they folded to the seeds that the dark matter created to form the galaxies that we see today. So this whole story spans over about 13 billion years. 
Okay, and that's the standard story that we understand. In this, and this you see the timeline. Now, there is a very special time in this, and this is the cosmic microwave background, which happened, uh, which was formed at when the universe was just 400,000 years old. And this is the time where this is what is known as the surface of last scattering for light. So at that time, the universe became cold enough that it was energetically favorable for protons and electrons primarily to form hydrogen atoms. And uh, light could propagate, the universe became transparent to light. Okay? This is a picture of that light as we know it today from the Planck satellite. Okay? And we first detected it back in the 50s. Um, now, uh, this, is, this has been a milestone for cosmology, in fact. All the pictures, ma many of the features that I talked about before were established due to this. It, it's very naive, of course, but this picture had a lot to do with it. In fact, it allowed us to measure the constituents of the universe, what the universe is made out of, uh, down to the percent precision. So this the surface of the cosmic microwave background turned us through cosmology into precision, cosmological observation, precision science. So it's been a milestone in an understanding of the origin of the universe and of galaxies. Now, the cosmic neutrino background now, it's a similar relic. It's a surface of last scattering for these, of sorts, of these, the, this is the time where the universe became transparent to this particle called neutrinos. And these particles inter interact much more weakly than light. So the universe became transparent to them at a much earlier time, but the universe was roughly a few MeV in temperature or in terms of age, it was just a fraction of a second old. And, uh, and these guys propagate till today, and they're a relic that we have seen their effects. The C C cosmic microwave background, the CMB, has allowed us to indirectly detect their presence through the, the gravitational effects on, on, uh, on what the cosmic microwave background looks like. So, first of all, okay, so let's go much into detail what is this relic of the Big Bang. First of all, for those of you that are not particle physicists and don't think about neutrinos all the, all, all the time, what are neutrinos? So neutrinos, in the standard model, there are particles that are partners of electrons, namely leptons, that don't carry charge, they don't have electric charge, okay, so they are neutral. And by, by virtue of that, they interact very weakly. The force that they interact with is the weak force that is related with radioactivity. And in fact, they were first detected through radioactive decays back in the 30s. And since then, they have been an extremely active field of research. Exactly because they interact very weakly, we don't know all of their properties yet very well. Um, in fact, the latest um, um, Nobel, there has been several Nobel Prizes to see how active a field is. Um, there's been several Nobel Prizes awarded to studying the properties and understanding how neutrinos behave. Um, the latest one was, uh, by, uh, was awarded to Kajita and uh, Art MacDonald uh, in 2015 for studying the properties of neutrino oscillations. Um, now, so these are the neutrinos, and cosmologically we have tons of sources of neutrinos. Very violent astrophysical events that will have that will be creating nuclei like supernovae um, will in fact automatically create these particles. Our sun, because there are nuclear processes in the sun, for example, is a, is a nearby source of neutrinos. Radio um, 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 uh, nuclear reactors are a great source of neutrinos. Neut nuclear bombs, even a greater source of neutrinos. <laughs> um, but these are all very different from these relic neutrinos, okay? And they are different in two ways. 
And you see it in this plot. So this is a plot that shows plots different source and the axis is you won't remember anyway. I've covered them up the units. You can ask me what they are later. Yeah, you talk about the units are. <laughs> so, exactly. I can tell you. I can tell <laughs> So the range starts from 10 to the minus. Uh, so the peak at the cosmic neutrino background is around 10 to minus 6 EV. And every tick is a log for power of 10 in energy. Okay, so, so if you count the ticks, it's like 20 ticks. Okay, so these are 20 uh, orders of magnitude there. In the flux here, it's units, if you want to know, centimeters square per second per steradian per MeV. <laughs> you ask and you shall receive. So, and up, up there, every tick there is two orders of magnitude. Okay, in a log scale. So this is a log scale plot. So this plot tells you two things. So these are very different sources of new, these neutrinos. And you will see the cosmic neutrino background goes all the way to the left, meaning this is the least energetic component of cosmogenic origin of neutrinos that we will ever create. And the reason is that these guys were created through radioactive processes essentially in the early universe. So their original energy was roughly an MeV, similar to the sources that you see from supernova or solar neutrinos. But the expansion of the universe redshifted their energy away. So today they are kind of trickling, at a, at a, depending on their mass, at 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3 of the speed of light. So they are non-relativistic still. They are not so sluggish, but they are much slower than any of the neutrinos that we'll ever create. Okay? The other thing that is not, uh, uh, it's, not about, it's not obvious is they are actually the most abundant neutrino co component that we'll ever create, too. So, so, and this is confusing, in fact, and I'll, I'll come back to that later, because solar neutrinos, uh, neutrinos from supernovae, uh, rad uh, uh, neutrinos from reactors, we have seen in laboratory. So if they are not so abundant, why are they so easy to see? Okay? And this is related to the fact that these guys are sluggish, and I'll come back to this. Okay? They move so slowly, they have so very little energy that they don't interact much. While all this, in fact, the neutrinos from Ice Cube that Ice Cube has detected, they are moving, they are so energetic that in fact the weak interactions at those energies are not so weak. Okay? Um, uh, so, so, even though they are the least popular in some ways neutrino species, they are the most abundant and they are the least energetic at the same time. Okay? Uh, so what are their properties? As I said already, they have been created when they, they, the universe became transparent to them when it was just a fraction of a second old. At the time they, when they decouple from the expansion, and they decouple from the expansion of the universe, so at the time they were relativistic, so even today their phase space follows a massless Fermi Dirac distribution. So when you talk about their temperature, which is roughly similar to that of the uh, photons from the CMB, only slightly less, uh, at 2 Kelvin, um, their temperature determines the momentum, not their overall kinetic energy. Okay? Now, another difference that they have from the, from the photons from the CMB is that there are particles, in principle, and antiparticles for neutrinos. For photons, there is no antiphoton and photon. Okay? And um, in fact, and in the standard model, we expect up to rumors that Bob is spreading. Uh, we expect that uh, uh, in the standard model, the number of neutrinos to antineutrinos is the same up to a factor of 10 to minus 9. So very close. Okay. Now, the results for the particle physics in the audience, you can ask me later what difference it makes. Um, the results that I will present apply for Dirac neutrinos exclusively. Okay? There is another type of neutrino called Majorana that's possible in nature, and you can ask me in the end about that. Okay? I'll defer that to the end. Um, the other thing is that neutrinos, um, if uh, people are familiar with the standard model, there are three types of neutrinos. Okay? There is the pattern of the electron, the electron neutrino, there is the pattern of the muon, the muon neutrino, and there is the pattern of the tau, the tau neutrino. 
Now, these are what we call flavor interaction eigenstates. Now, what we measure in the lab, especially for these uh, relic neutrinos that are non-lativistic today, they are mass eigenstates. So these mass eigenstates do not necessarily, do not align with the flavor eigenstates. And the, that misalignment will introduce an order one correction in the number that I'm going to talk about. So I will assume that the two bases align and I'll move on from here. So this is the neutrino mass hierarchy. What do we know about the neutrinos? As I said, we know there are three mass states. What we have measured in the laboratory in, and, and, in, uh, from, and observing neutrinos from the sun is uh, neutrino mass differences. Now, and the reason that happens is because neutrinos are cool in one more way. I think they are cool in many ways. One way they are cool is because they don't interact much, they remain very quantum, if you want. Their wave dynamics are very important. So every time you, you have a, an interaction, you create one flavor of neutrino, okay? But that doesn't mean you have created the same mass eigenstate from neutrino. So as neutrinos propagate, they will oscillate between different mass eigenstates. And these neutrinos oscillations, which are basically quantum mechanics or wave dynamics in a macroscopic scales, we have observed in many experiments by now. And this is the summary of the results. So they are sensitive to the mass differences squared of neutrinos. And we can, from what we know, we don't know the absolute scale yet of this. We have some idea from cosmology. And all we know, we can have the three mass eigenstate can be, um, a, can be, um, a, can be uh, set like an, a, what we call normal hierarchy. So you have two light states set nearby, one heavy, or uh, inverted hierarchy, uh, which is, uh, which we have two heavy guys and one light. But the absolute scale we don't know, and this is the value of uh, the things. The color code tells you what admixture of flavors you have in each neutrino species, okay? But that's to be complete. Now, so why do we care, okay? So why is the sinew being important? We've seen the cosmic microwave background, right? So we've learned a lot of it, and it's an extremely um, active field of research. What more could we learn from the CNUB? And uh, there are several things. First of all, in principle, the, the CNUB, the cosmic neutrino background, came from a time much before the cosmic microwave background. So in principle, it has access to more primordial information that the cosmic microwave background does. The other thing, it is generated by the neutrinos because, as I said, um, they interact so weakly that we haven't studied their properties fully. So it's the one sector in the standard model that we don't know many things about. Okay? Now, um, turns out that I, when, when, when Savas and I started working on the cosmic neutrino background, we haven't put so much thought in what information we can extract for, from it. And um, actually, I was surprised to learn that I think the community has not spent a lot of energy trying to understand what type of information you can extract from it. These are two interesting papers for you to look at. One is from Dodelson from 2009. Jeong et al. is from Mark Amyokovsky's group in 2014. Now, the Dodelson paper makes the following interesting observation. The cosmic neutrinos today are non-relativistic. So, if you calculate how much distance they traveled in the universe, the co-moving distance they've traveled in the universe, going back in time, in the last 13 billion years, you'll see they come essentially from a nearby neighborhood of roughly anywhere between 100, hundreds of megaparsecs all the way, depending on their mass, to 10, 10 gigaparsecs, okay? And the effects and, and how much distance they travel now, because they are non-relativistic, uh, they depend very much on their velocity. So it's highly chromatic, so their effects. Um, so this is something that Dodelson points out. So it's a, it's a different type of probe. It's a different type of CMB in principle, the way it behaves as it goes through the, 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 uh, the galaxies or 
galaxy clusters. Um, in fact, the way um, I was at, when I was at Perimeter, uh, Gilbert Holder, who is a professor at uh, Urbana Champaign, uh, pointed me to those papers and he said, uh, neutrinos, and kind of verbatim, he says, the cosmic neutrino background is cool because you're released from the slavery of the light cone. <laughs> <laughs> So because they move slowly, their effects, when it comes even from lensing, gravitational lensing, they're highly chromatic. So in some sense, they behave completely differently uh, compared to the cosmic uh, microwave background. But, um, and, uh, and, and I, I think there is a lot, uh, there is definitely a lot to learn from it, if we were able to detect, yes? Can you put a, a limit on the chromaticity? Uh, what do you mean by limit? So it's order one, right? It's a lot. It's a lot, right? Because they follow Fermi Dirac, automatically the spread in their momentum is order one. So when you calculate, if you look at the Dodelson paper, in the co-moving distance that you cover, it's a factor of a few. I mean, it can be down to 100 and can go down to one gigaparsec. So depending on the mass, of course. So the, the more, uh, the more uh, slow they are, the bigger the chromatic effects. Okay. Um, uh, the, yeah, the Dobbelson paper is a nice read. Yes. The limit of the heaviest mass. The low, if you take the lower uh, limit on the heaviest, it will take roughly yeah a few hundreds of megaparsecs if I remember correctly. Okay. And the lighter ones can take you to a gigaparsec. Uh, well, the lighter ones can be, the lightest one can be relativistic. So in principle, it's the same as the CMB, okay? Uh, so it can go all the way back to 10 gigaparsec. Okay, so now I've, I spent uh, a significant component of my talk actually advertising the, C, the CUB. But the, 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 okay, where is it though? So the cosmic microwave background was much easier to see because it's photons. So in fact, the technology to really observe the CMB is not, is not necessarily groundbreaking. They preserved it in the 50s. They had this horn antenna. There is the famous story about pigeons dying uh, because they thought it was noise from the pigeons delecting material on the antenna. So, um, uh, so the main thing is, as I said, neutrinos interact with a weak force, so they interact weakly. Okay, and the way we usually detect things in um, in uh, uh, in particle physics is through scattering. We have either we collide things or we have a detector and we expect cosmic rays to come in, kick our detector, and deposit some energy on it. Now there are two problems with that for neutrinos. First of all, their coupling is very small, so the cross section goes like coupling squared, and their energy is very small. Okay, so the cross section is small for cosmic neutrinos, and at the same time, the energy they observe is so small it's impossible to detect. Okay. Uh, now there are tricks you can play to make things a bit better. One thing you can do, for example, is you can actually um, absorb the cosmic neutrino background, and this is an idea that Weinberg had in 1962. Um, uh, so he said that in, in, if, you, if, you take, if you take radioactive process, for example, if you take a tritium nucleus, can absorb an electron neutrino from the cosmic neutrino background and convert to a, to a helium nucleus plus an electron. Okay? And this is the idea behind the only existed, not working, but funded idea, uh, at least at the R&D stage, to look for the cosmic neutrino background. Um, and, uh, and the cross-section is greatly enhanced because the Q, there is energy released during this process, so the cross-section is, is large. The problem, of course, is the backgrounds that you have. You have the tritium will naturally decay <laughs> uh, with a 12 years lifetime. So you have tons of background you have to fight against. So this is a very hard experiment. Now, the other idea that people have, if because these neutrinos, the cosmic neutrinos are, are very slow, their De Broglie wavelength is macroscopic. It's actually of order of millimeter. So if you have an object within a millimeter, of size a millimeter, the neutrinos will couple coherently to the entire object. So the cross-section, 
the interaction rate gets enhanced. Nevertheless, the momentum left behind is still very small. So this still gives a very small kick to whatever millimeter object you have. Um, now the effects that Savas and I started uh, looking at is effects that are not related with cross-section, but effects that are related with refraction. And those effects, turns out, uh, depend not that the coupling squared, but that the coupling. Okay? So if you have a small coupling, uh, the coupling squared is actually much smaller than the coupling itself. Okay? So refractive effects happens for everything. We know it from light, but people use it to manipulate neutrons coming out of reactors. Okay, we know it happens for electrons. So, so this is refractions and effect for happens for every particle. And it happens when you have a wave moving from one medium to another. Okay, and it's the slight bending of their trajectories. Of course, there are differences between these neutrinos and light, as you can imagine. Um, first of all, light bends quite a bit. These guys bend by very little. Okay, and uh, the other thing is, of course, you also have neutrinos and antineutrinos, which tells you that the angle of bending is different. Okay, now, um, so where does this bending come from? You can think about it intuitively as the following way. So if I put an atom in, in the sea of neutrinos, it will feel a for, a, an interaction energy due to the weak force that's proportional to the charge that the atom carries, the Fermi constant, the coupling strength of neutrinos, and the neutrino, anti-neutrino density difference. Okay? Vice versa, the same thing for neutrinos. If you put a neutrino inside, close to the vicinity of material, it will feel an interaction uh, a potential. Now, so, so these refractive effects, so people have thought about them for a while, so they said, okay, if I have an atom and it feels an interaction, can there be a force on it? So can I feel the wind uh, from the cosmic neutrino background? Uh, turns out that for, for reasons that in retrospect were completely obvious, the answer is no. Because if you have a uniform distribution of neutrinos and antineutrinos, the force will be zero because there is no gradient of the potential. Okay? And this was the source of a no-go that people put down in paper, Kabimbo Mayani and Lagaker and collaborators put back down in paper in 1982 and actually put a stop, a virtual stop to all ideas that, that any, any real um, exploration of the refractive properties of the cosmic neutrino background. Okay. Um, now there was one effect that survived for completeness, I will mention it. So there is neutrinos because the weak force um, cares about chirality, uh, it violates parity. So if you put a spin in the cosmic neutrino background, spin up versus spin down will feel different energies. Okay, and that is again proportional to the neutrino and the neutrino uh, density difference, which in principle is very small. So if you plug everything in, even the only non-zero effects from the small energy splitting is too small to be detected. It's like 22 orders of magnitude compared to the best that we've done in laboratory settings. Okay, so things are not looking great. Okay, so. What Savas and I found is that, in fact, the presence of large spherical objects, astrophysical objects, like the sun, neutron stars, the earth, locally changes, uh, based essentially because of refractive effects, changes the local distribution of the CNUB enough to give you a non-zero force. And that force is proportional to the square root of G Fermi, to the square root of the coupling. Okay, um, and, and that affects proportion to the square root of the coupling. So, um, so in order to do that, this is the summary of the idea. So, for very large objects, um, you can represent particles as rays. Okay, 
And on the left here, you see that you have rays that you have electron antineutrinos and muon and tau neutrinos. And on the right, you have, uh, you have the uh, electron neutrino and muon and tau antineutrino. Now, for, for, elect for electron antineutrinos and muon and tau neutrinos, and there is a difference here, so if I look at these rays as they go through the Earth, they are attracted by the Earth, so these rays, their trajectories move away from the surface, so they fan out. Um, electron neutrinos, on the other hand, re are repelled from the Earth. So the particle rays, their trajectories, are uh, the particles slow down, so their trajectories move closer to the surface. Eventually, when they come at extremely glazing incidence, they can be bounced back from the surface. Okay, and it turns out that this difference uh, of behavior is responsible for enhancing the neutrino antineutrino asymmetry on the surface of the Earth, and you get more antineutrinos relative to neutri uh, uh, more sorry neutrinos electron neutrinos relative to electron antineutrinos on the surface of the Earth. Okay. Um, so for the rest of the talk, the, the sign of the interaction depends on the type of muon or tau you have. For the rest of the talk, I will just drop and I will, talk, I will drop flavor indices and I will say that neutrinos are repelled from the Earth, antineutrinos are attracted from the Earth, just to simplify our lives, even though I will give details about the magnitude of the effect. So how do you model this interaction in, in reality? So first of all, we know from cosmology and from astrophysical observations that there is a possible range, um, and a laboratory observation where there is a possible range of neutrino masses for the heaviest guy, and that's somewhere between 0.05 EV and 0.8 EV. Now, the 0.8 EV comes from Katrin, and I consider that very optimistic because it ignores astrophysical observations, which puts a more realistic bound of 0.12 EV. And in fact, I think we know the range of mass of the heaviest neutrino within a factor of two. Okay, two or three. Now, because these guys are non relativistic, they obey what else? The Schrödinger equation. So, what we have to do is solve the Schrödinger equation in the presence of a very, mad, a very massive object. Um, and in order to do that, we need to know what potential to plug in here. And that potential um, is given by this interaction is matter, come from the vector interaction of these neutrinos, and it's proportional to the Fermi constant, the density of atoms, and the charge of each atom, which depends on the flavor of the neutrino. Okay? So for electron neutrinos, this is where the difference in the sign of the behavior between electron and neut uh, neutrinos and muon and tau neutrinos comes in. So, so this, the, the weak charge for, uh, for atoms is, differs depending on the flavor, and you see it here. Now, the number to remember that inside matter, this interaction potential is anywhere between 10 to the minus 13 EV and 10 to the minus 15 EV, compared to the characteristic energy with, of the neutrino, which is 10 to the minus 6 EV, okay? Fractionally, we're talking about an excess of 10 to the minus 8. Um, so in order to model that, so let's try to solve the Schrodinger equation, let's go to one dimension, that's all that we can do most of the time. So when we have a wave incident on a boundary, we preserve energy, and we solve for the momentum of the wave inside and outside, okay, the material. So, so energy conservation relates the momentum inside the material to the momentum outside, and this is how you define the refractive index. The refractive index me measures essentially the fractional energy change of the particle relative to its kinetic energy. And for neutrinos, just a number to remember is 10 minus 8 to 10 minus 7, which is similar to what it is for X-rays. Okay? For X-rays, these are not uh, these are not numbers that are unheard of. Um, if you use attractive, you get an index of refraction that's larger than one. If U is repulsive, you get an index of refraction that's less than one, okay? Uh, and this is a list, just for completeness, you see different material. Um, I wish the Earth was made out of gold. <laughs> that would have been great. <laughs> 
but it's not. Uh, so instead it's made out of dirt, so it's a factor of 10 smaller. Um, it gives you an idea of the roughly of orders of magnitude of scale of things that we're talking about, okay? So now let's solve the problem. So let's start again with one dimension. And what we have is when neutrinos hit a big object, um, what we have to do is go to the surface and look at how much wave is reflected, how much wave is transmitted. This is what we know how to do from, um, uh, from, uh, from in, in, in quantum mechanics, in undergraduate quantum mechanics, when we do wave scattering from potential well, okay? Now, for most of the waves, the typical energy is very high, so there is not much reflection happening, most of the waves transmitted, and there's nothing uh, important happening in their, in their uh, properties. Now, but as for neutrinos though, that have very little energy, energy compared to the height of the potential barrier, their kinetic energy would be drastically modified. Now eventually for the ones that are repelled for, neutr for neutrinos, you will see that if you have energy less than the barrier, you cannot penetrate the inside of the material. And this is where you have total reflection. And this is a regime that we know from optics, okay? You still have some penetration of the wave inside the material. And this is what is known in optics as the evanescent wave regime. And this is a scale that will be very important in what I'm talking about. So, so all of the physics comes from neutrinos whose energy is comparable to the, to the height of the barrier, okay? Now this is in 1D, and, and, and in fact we have to do it in 3D, um, for a perfect plane is, uh, is a 2D problem, which is great. So, so what we have is when waves come at an angle, okay, we do the same process where we match the wave function at the boundary, and we look how much wave, and then it's first derivative, and we see how much wave is reflected and how much wave is transmitted. And all the properties, because if you have an infinite plane as the interface between two material, all that matters is the momentum perpendicular to the surface. Because of translational invariance, the momentum parallel to the surface is preserved. So when you calculate the reflection coefficient and the transmission coefficient, it only depends on the momentum perpendicular to the surface. Okay. And this is what actually helps a lot. You don't require the full energy to have significant effects to be comparable to the height of the barrier. All you require to the kinetic energy perpendicular to the surface to be significant. Um, now, and this is what you see the formulas and probably people have extracted them in, in their quantum mechanics class. Interestingly enough, you can get Snell's law from translational invariance, okay? Snell's law is a consequence of symmetries in the problem, which is actually a very interesting way to see it. Yes? What is the wavelength of the neutrinos you're trying to detect? So it's a few millimeters. What about roughness? Okay, I'll come back to roughness, okay? So, so turns out for, for the effects that we care about, what matters is, and this is something that people, this is an excellent question, and this is what people care about in, in X-ray experiments. <laughs> so when you do grazing incidents, because this is exactly what we're doing, what matters, in fact, the momentum is not the relevant thing. The momentum is the, mom what matters is the momentum transfer. And when you have at grazing incidents, what matters is K perp, and that's really small. So the scale for that is three meters, I will, I will say. So what you require is places where the Earth is flatter than three meters, and I will, there are places like that. Utah, <laughs> or, uh, or uh, the Maldives, or Salar de Oyuni in Bolivia. <laughs> I know you do, but I'm advertising. <laughs> I like the Maldives, I have to say. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, but, but basically you said the rest of the talk. <laughs> so, so the bottom line, so let, now let's look at neutrinos that are repelled from the Earth, okay? As I said, eventually, 
if when the energy perpendicular to the surface becomes less than the height of the barrier, you get total reflection. Formally, this means the condition for that to happen is that k perp, the, perpend the momentum perpendicular to the surface on the inside, inside the material, has to be zero. And this gives you the critical condition for reflection. And the angle is related to the square root of the index of refraction. And now you see you had an index of refraction that was different by, by one by a level of 10 to the minus 8. So now the square root of that is 10 minus 4, much larger. So you start seeing how the effect gets uh, enhanced. Okay? So, uh, so when, when you go, we have incidence angles larger than critical, so you go even more grace in incidence, this, case, this momentum inside becomes imaginary, and this is where you transition to the evanescent wave regime that is not accessible classically. This is pure wave dynamics. Okay? And, and uh, the condition for that to happen is that the momentum outside is less than that square root of 2 mu. Okay, the kinetic energy has to be less than the potential uh, barrier. Um, now, uh, this is the extreme that happens for neutrinos. Interesting also things happen also for, for anti-neutrinos that are attracted from the Earth. So for them, there is never total reflection in the way that there is for neutrinos. You never reach the evanescent wave regime. But when they are energy perpendicular to the surface becomes comparable to the barrier, the momentum inside changes by order one. Eventually what you see happening is that even the ones that are come at extremely grazing incidence angles, they always have a momentum perpendicular to the surface, meaning they are always moving faster inside. So that tells you that when you draw the rays that are refracted inside the material, there is always a minimum, a maximum angle that can form with the surface, okay? Which is also related to the square root of two delta. So the effects of this kinetic energy being perpendicular to the surface, being comparable to the barrier, affect both neutrinos and antineutrinos in different ways, but significant ways, okay? Um, so now, so the, this happens now for all neutrinos and antineutrinos that come at grazing incidence, and this automatically tells you how many neutrinos are affected, the fraction of neutrinos, and that's the ratio of the momentum perpendicular to the surface for this in, for, that you need to have for the synthesis effects to arise over the overall moment of the neutrino, and that's roughly 10 to the minus 4, and it grows with the square root of the mass of the neutrinos. Okay? So it has a weak dependence of the mass, and it depends on the square root, very importantly, of u, which is the square root of the coupling interaction strength of the neutrinos. Okay? So this means a fraction of 10 to the minus 4, and this is where, the, this is essentially the size of the effect that we expect. The scale of variation when you plug in the numbers, even though the momentum of neutrinos is a few millimeters, the scale of variation that's relevant for homogeneity or all the dynamics is three meters, which is very macroscopic, but at the same time is much smaller than any cosmological scale you can imagine, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, so now let's do a toy model. And this is what we call, Savas and I call the flat earth approximation. So we assume that there is, so we assume that half a space is filled with matter, half the space is empty, and neutrinos are coming only from one side. Okay? And then you, you can calculate the fractional asymmetry by integrating the neutrino and anti, minus the antineutrino density of waves that come from uh, different angles, and then average over momentum, taking into account that they obey a Fermi Dirac distribution. Once you do that, you get a picture that looks like this. This is the size of the fractional asymmetry of neutrinos versus antineutrinos um, at the interface the boundary, as a function of the distance of the boundary in meters, okay? So the, the, the maximum size of the asymmetry is, as I said before, the square root of the difference of the index of refraction from one, so it's roughly 10 to the minus four. And now let's look at things in more detail. So on the, on, the, on the right side of this figure, I have the inside of the matter, and this decay 
is related to the evanescent wave regime, the exponential decay of the evanescent wave regime. Now, on the, on the other side, sorry, on the other side, in the vacuum side, you get a similar behavior. But that happens for another reason. So when we, waves are reflected from a surface, a surface, you have standing waves of different momenta. So when they interfere, this roughly exponential decay appears, reappears. And the scale of variation is again related to this k-perp, this critical momentum for things to happen, the three meter scale. So the three meter scale can arise both because of this exponential decay in the, non, in the, in the wave dynamics in the non-classical regime, but also from interference effects. Okay? Now, in this toy model that Savas and I did, if you look at the asymptotics of this plot, you'll see that the asymmetry doesn't go to zero. And that's just a byproduct of the fact that we have neutrinos coming from one side. Okay? Now, from, from, from this side too. Now, whether or not inside the material the asymmetry and zip or, or, or goes to something that's, uh, that's non-zero depends on the shape, okay? Um, uh, but for the Earth, I mean, it's, it's a bit subtle and you can ask me that later. Now, beyond the flat Earth approximation, of course, the, the Earth is not half full with material, the, the world is not half full with material and the rest empty, you have a sphere. Right? The sphere is also not flat. And neutrinos are coming from everywhere, from all directions. Okay? So, the key point is that because you, the, so the, you have things that bounce off the surface, but at the same time, whatever enters the Earth has to exit the Earth because they are not in a bound trajectory. Whatever comes in has to comes out, come out. What does that mean? It means that when you look at the surface of the Earth, there are no anti-neutrinos hitting the back of the surface with angle larger than theta critical so that they can, they can get reflected, reflected and cancel the effect. So the square root of two delta effect, the 10 to the minus four effect for cosmic neutrinos that I advertised before, we expect that to persist on the surface of the Earth merely due to the sphericity of the Earth. Okay? And uh, I've confirmed this, of course, with, with uh, calculations, but um, uh, uh, yeah, but ultimately the local inhomogeneities would determine the, the shape the exact shape, because local inhomogeneity in most cases, it's never a perfectly flat surface. In fact, for, for the range of scales that we care about, in fact, we think that the patch needs to be um, flat enough within 10 to 100 kilometers area, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and at those scales, even the curvature of the Earth, it's not clear, it plays any importance. So the local inhomogeneities that are the ones that will determine the shape. But we expect, um, and this is where uh, Bob's question comes in. So we need to have flat enough spaces, we need to look for places on the Earth that are flat enough so the size of bumps or depressions are not bigger than roughly three meters. And there are several interesting places around the world. <laughs> uh, one interesting uh, trivia is that for Salardo units in Bolivia, it's in the Andes, um, it's so flat, it's so big, it's 100,000 kilometers, kilometers squares across, it's huge. And they use it to calibrate satellites. It's so flat, it's flatter than a meter. Like, it's really flat. <laughs> um, so, so there are places in the Earth where we think that the local inhomogeneities, mountains and valleys, won't, uh, uh, won't affect this distribution. So ultimately, this is a summary of what we expect to see on the surface of the Earth. So we expect to see an enhancement of the local neutrino, uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino asymmetry, which is set by the square root of the, of the difference of the index of refraction of neutrinos from one, which is the level of 10 to the minus four. This is five orders of magnitude larger than the naive expectation on the standard model, modulo again Bob's rumors. Um, and this is a summary for different uh, neutrino masses. This is what you would expect to see. This is the fractional asymmetry as a function of the distance from the surface of the Earth. Now, the point eight, as I keep saying, this is very optimistic. This is said by the Katrin experiment. 
And it also includes possible effects of neutrino clustering in the, uh, in the cluster, in, the local, in our local cluster. So I think this is extremely optimistic. I think the reality lies somewhere in between what you see the orange curve and the green curve. Okay. Um, so now, um, okay, then we'll go back to the beginning. So this is the summary. So what have we achieved? What the main thing that we have achieved is to actually create a gradient for the neutrino distribution that's close to the surface of the Earth. So if I were to place an atom now, or a bunch of atoms, they will feel a force because there is a gradient. So the force that was previously thought to be zero. And that force is of the enormous magnitude for a 10 centimeter sized tungsten sphere of 10 to the minus 31 Newton. Just to give you an idea, it's like uh, a carbon atom, okay, a carbon atom is uh, uh, about a million times heavier, okay, just a carbon atom. <laughs> it's not too great, okay, and even the craziest experiment a theorist can imagine, because an experimentalist would not imagine, <laughs> would find itself orders of magnitude about a factor of a thousand away. If you take a crazy quantum limit for the tungsten sphere and you cool it to some uh, very low frequency trap, so it's, it's, but it's non zero nevertheless and it sets a target. It's small, okay? We, we, we have no illusions about the smallness of this number. Um, now, the, the spin effect that I was talking about before, that was non zero before, it's also enhanced by quite a bit. But now, the force always dominates. So if you were to convert the force that I talked about before in a torsion balance experiment into a torque, it will give you five orders of magnitude bigger size than the, uh, ten, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 10 to the four times bigger, uh, the, the gradient force will be 10 to the four times larger, sorry. Um, so all of these effects are still small. Okay. Nevertheless, they are greatly enhanced in the vicinity of the Earth, and the Earth comes for free. Okay. We don't have to build anything to get this effect. So to summarize, uh, we think that the presence of matter, when you have extremely large objects, will modify the cosmic neutrino background, and it will create an excess of a net excess of neutrinos, things that are repelled from the Earth relative to anti neutrinos that's five orders of magnitude larger than the expectation. And uh, the gradient, so it gives you a zone of roughly three meters above and below the surface of the Earth. I actually think it may happen also in, in different areas inside the Earth where you have huge changes of density, but those are harder to probe. <laughs> Georgia is laughing. <laughs> um, so it opens up new possibilities, like the forces that you thought were before non-zero now become, uh, you thought were zero before, now are non-zero, okay? And, uh, um, and it's such a challenge for the future. Uh, now, just to bring back the Earth, this will happen in every big astrophysical uh, object, meaning the Sun, neutron stars. In fact, in neutron stars, these effects are no longer small. For neutron stars, the index of refraction of these guys is order one, different from one. So, so then the effects are, are magnified in neutron stars, and in fact, we're thinking if there will be any sort of interesting signature from these, uh, from these strong interaction potentials in neutron stars. It's not clear, by the way, at all. But uh, in astrophysical objects, in other astrophysical objects, this could be even bigger uh, than it is on the Earth. And uh, um, but nevertheless, it's still futuristic. And as I said, it's such a challenge for new experiments that look to detect the CNUB. And, and, um, and, and Savas, when Savas and I started thinking about this um, two years ago, uh, we always, and, and, and every particle physics student, I think at some point in their career, has said, oh, what is a way to detect the cosmic neutrino background? And you kind of always fail <laughs> because you're always trying to think about detection first. And, and, and the thing about the cosmic neutrino background, given, given that they are already there, it puts everything, it's a different standard, okay? 
it's a part of the standard model. So the discovery of the cosmic neutrino background is more akin to the discovery of gravitational waves. And when you think about it this way, I think we need to think about longer time scales. And interesting things can happen when you think about longer time scales. So this is a plot that shows how much the atomic clock sensitivity has improved over the last few decades. And you see it has never really veered away from an exponential. In fact, the exponential accelerates sometimes. It takes time, okay? But when you have a worthwhile target, things can happen. Okay, and, um, and this is for atomic clocks. Electric dipole moments are another great example. In fact, the two are correlated because they use similar, te uh, similar techniques. WIMP searches, direct detection searches for, for dark matter also have shown this type of... Uh, so even though things are small, it doesn't mean that we need to give up thinking about them. Okay, and we cannot reject them right away. Because ultimately what, what we care about is could we, could it, how would the universe look like when, when it was just, what, what, what does it look like when it's just a fraction of a second old? So detecting the CUB can give us uh, a glimpse of that. And with this I am, thank you. <laughs> Question back there. Yeah, so what, what is the dominant thing that changes in this whole picture, the neutrino or Majorana? Ah, great! Excellent, thank you for asking. It disappears completely. No, no, well, no, there is a force, it's just of order the index of the delta, the index of refraction, so it's of, uh, the effect is of order 10 to the minus 8. So, now going back, so when I say well, large objects, what do I mean? What do you need to happen for something to consider large and for, the, for, for, for these effects to happen? What you care about, turns out, is you need to be in the geometric optics regime. So you need the phase that the wave accumulates as it goes through the object to be different from the outside by order one. So K, the momentum, times delta, how different the index of refractions from the outside, times the size of the object, has to be larger than one. For Dirac neutrinos, this happens automatically for the Earth. Unfortunately for stupid Majoranas, they are an equal superposition up to velocity dependent effects of particle and antiparticle, so the effect cancels up to factors of the velocity, which is 10 to the minus 2 of the speed of light. So when you plug in the numbers, turns out they don't satisfy that requirement. They satisfy it for the sun, though, and for neutral stars, but I don't think anyone cares at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, yeah, we were really bummed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Could you please remind me um, what the uh, energy density is of this background today? So, so the number density is 100 per centimeter cubed. So in your tip of your finger, 100 particles per species. Okay? If three species, 300. With a Dirac, energy with for a Dirac distribution momentum. Momentum. So the energy depends on the mass. So this is 10 to the minus 6 eV if the mass is 0.1 eV. So it's not very energetic, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, it's pretty cold. It's pretty, pretty cold, unfortunately. Um, okay. It's still the most abundant species in the, yeah, the yeah. standard model in the universe, except for the photons, which are the same. Yeah, it's like 400 for the photons and 300. Despite having decoupled waves in there? Yeah, I, that's exactly why they are colder. In fact, there was entropy injection due to the, the, the electrons annihilating to photons, and that cooled them relative to the photons. So that entropy injection from electron annihilation cooled them, and there's the famous factor of, what is it, 7-11? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yes? Oh, do you have? Well, apropos of this question, I mean, since they're... They must be a lot more dense at the center of the Earth just because of gravitational mass. Ah, good. So they still move very fast, right? So their velocity is 10 to the minus 2. If you square that, that's 10 to the minus 4. So the gravitational lens effects are really small compared, and the gradients of that, are, they affect neutrinos and antineutrinos the same. So it's, uh, 
Maybe, I mean, maybe Roger knows better. You're shaking your head. That's why I'm asking. Don't forget. It's a, it's a tiny correction. For the Earth. Yeah, for the Earth. For the uh, neutron stars big. Yeah, for the neutron stars big. The sun well, let's, let's go get one of those. <laughs> exactly. Let's go grab one. Yeah. Boy, that would be useful in many. You go first. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. I'll send you the spaceship back. <laughs> Yeah, they're close to the Fermi days, right? eh? so they, they are close to the Fermi days. They are Actually, yeah, that's very interesting. So you can't squeeze them much more. Much yeah. more. Yeah, this is actually kind of neat, actually. They are very close to being also degenerate. Better. They are very close. No, 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 no. no. So, they are, so, so they are and they are not, okay? They are far enough for us not to care. But just to give you an idea, if you calculate the occupation number in the, the, the occupation number, at the average momentum is 1%. If you go a few times less, is, is 30%. So they are close to make it like, if you want to do precision things that you would detect it, but for all we care about, we can just ignore it. Okay, they're warm. They're warm, yeah. <laughs> they're warm, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Well, maybe this is sort of a follow-up on Bob's question, but I, I'm just pondering since they're non-relativistic, yeah. what, what phenomenology is associated with gravitation? And, and so maybe the Earth is not enough, but the sun maybe? So, so people have calculated lensing from the sun. So there is a paper out, and I forget how big the effect is. So, so this affects neutrinos and antineutrinos the same. So it's an overall much larger scale variation. I think it was at the percent level, but I could be wrong. Now, the biggest effects can come from clustering. Actually, there are two things. So they can come from clustering of neutrinos in the overall cluster. We, have, we live in a cluster of galaxies. That's a big, massive structure. And there, the escape velocity is actually can be comparable to 10 minus 2. So you can have a significant fraction of these guys captured there. So it can locally enhance the density. The other thing is that going back to the, to the CNU B properties, because they are so slow, they can be lensed efficiently. So the Einstein radius when you do, for example, people look at CMB, cosmic microwave background lensing for many things. Now these effects are greatly enhanced for these cosmic neutrinos and there's a paper in, from 2019 by Gil Holder where he looks at those things. Not in much detail, but again, you are released from the slavery as he told me of the, of the, of the light cone. So they are highly chromatic. So you can have different, you can do tomography in some ways, because different energies are at different distances. You can do a new type of tomography because the surface of Las Catrin is not really a surface, it's more like a volume, uh, which is really cool. Yeah, yes? Um, so I'm, I think I'm missing the, the link between what sounds like a Coulomb calorimetry type experiment where you imagine you could measure this, like this moment. Bouncing off? Yeah. Yeah. You turn that into a map, like, like the, like oh, how would you turn it yeah, into a map? Like, how do you make an image? Like, oh, God, you image? will need directional information for that, right? Because you will need to map out different directions. Yes, uh, pff, it depends on the way you detect them, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer, unfortunately, because that will depend on the way you detect them. So, But you will definitely see, need a directional detector, yeah. right? Like you do in the CMB, right? You map, map out parts of the sky. So. But no, isn't the directional information is destroyed in this in this refraction? Uh, oh, it's not clear. If you would be able, it's not clear because even for light, right? If you look at every even the CMB, when you detect it, it's refracted because these cone antennas kind of bend the rays. So you have to be careful. It depends on your angular resolution. It depends on many things. So once you have a concrete way to detect, and uh, this is going far, so I haven't really put, uh, bec uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's an excellent question. So you will have to think about how to detect them, but I think once we have a way to detect them at the necessary precision, we won't get stuck there, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm more worried, actually, I'll tell you, this is something that I don't understand. So, for example, one of the things I didn't spend more time advertising the properties of the CNUB, and this is my failure because I don't understand it very well, how much of the actual primordial information survives? Given that the things are, are, are become non-relativistic, and if you trace back the moving distance, you go back to one gigaparsec, 
how much of the primordial information survives. So this Kamiokowski paper from 2014 claims there is information that survives, but I don't understand it very well. And claims though you have to go to very small angles. That makes it much harder because the flux that you will get from this little patch of the spy, sky will be even smaller than integrating over the entire patch. So anyway, so this is, I mean, it's an interesting question, but um, it all depends. If we can do it for the CMB, I don't see why we cannot do it for the CUB eventually, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and in principle. <laughs> More questions? Okay, let's thank you. So, if we, so